Tonight, guilty as charged. All three men accused in the killing of Ahmad Arbery, guilty of felony murder. But the legal proceedings against them are just getting started. I'll tell you why. And then death by suicide. We now know Brian Laundry shot himself in that Florida swamp. Is that the end of the Gabby Petito investigation? Or could other people still be charged in the case? And where is Summer Wells? The five-year-old has been missing for more than five months. Will a new reward help bring her home? And then hopefully all of you are off for Thanksgiving tomorrow, but thousands of police officers don't have that luxury. No matter the day, they're dealing with situations like these. Hey, get your hands up. Get your get, get your hands up. Shoot my, my up. Shoot my hands up. Show us your other hand. Get your hands up. That is on Policing in America tonight on Banfield. Welcome to Banfield. I'm Brian Enton in for Ashley tonight. Justice for Ahmad Arbery. All three men accused in his killing were found guilty of felony murder today. Of Glenn County, state of Georgia. The state of Georgia versus Travis McMichael. Case number CR000433. Jury verdict form. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. The man who pulled the trigger, Travis McMichael, was found guilty on all nine counts he faced. His father, Gregory McMichael, guilty on eight of nine. And William Bryan, the McMichael's neighbor who filmed the fatal encounter, guilty on six of the nine counts that he faced. It was an emotional trial with racial and political undertones, but it took the almost all white jury less than two days to convict them. This sets up the next part of the legal proceedings. In 10 weeks, February 7th, 2022, all three men will stand on trial for federal hate crime charges. The Department of Justice has charged them with interfering with Arbery's civil rights and attempted kidnapping. I want to bring in News Nation's Janelle Fort, who is in Brunswick, Georgia. Janelle, I know you've been there for weeks. I've been watching your reports every day. Uh, you were showing us more and more people coming to town to prepare to protest. But tonight, uh, I'm assuming it's calm. Is it almost more of like a celebratory tone because of the verdict? A little earlier, Brian, it was a lot more celebratory. At this point, most people have gone home or gone to wherever they're going to celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday. But I think that the, for the majority of people who came here, they weren't sure what to expect. This was one of those cases that wasn't really cut dry and in leading into the deliberations or the verdict on which way this was going to go. Again, we had that disproportionately white jury in a case that was racially charged. So many people came here not knowing if they were going to celebrate or if they were going to protest, obviously they ended up celebrating a little earlier. And then, you know, by now it's about 10 o'clock here. And most of those people have gone ahead and left. Yeah, it looks pretty quiet behind you. Um, I was really on the edge of my seat, like so many in America, when the when the verdict was read this afternoon. Uh, and there was this emotional moment with Arbery's dad uh, right after he heard the verdict. Let's listen. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Oh. I'm going to ask that whoever just made an outburst be removed from the court, please. As this court has indicated, I ask that there be no outbursts in the court, and I expect as much from the gallery. Please respect the court's... Um, a desire for this as we move forward. If you feel like you need to make a comment or otherwise demonstrate with respect to the verdict, I do ask. And you could uh, you could hear Arbery's dad. You could see him in the background there, obviously uh, excited by, by the verdict. I know you spoke to him just a short time after that when he came outside the courthouse. Uh, what did he have to say? Well, you know, Brian, this was a case where this family didn't think that they would see this day. They didn't even think they'd have a chance to have this case heard by a jury. So that was the big focus for him. You know, they had been working so hard to have justice for his son. 
And finally, they're getting that moment. I want to share a piece of that interview with you guys. Take a listen. He did nothing wrong. So we just kept on fighting. We just kept on digging to the right people hear you, hear your cry. Mm -hmm. And then when people hear your cry, they say something in right here, and then God sent a lot of help to us. Like my turn to him, Cliff, I thank God for him. I thank God for all his support because without him, I don't know where I was, my Pastor Baker, because yeah. he just kept encouraging me every day, wrapping his arm around me like he been knowing me 100 years. So I thank God for all those people that didn't give up on him then. The day is a good day. You know, we got to let the world know that you can't lynch a black man in broad daylight without being counted for it. So the day is a good day, though. We got to convince you. Amen. Yes. How did you keep your strength throughout all of this? Through God. God gave me the strength to keep going. And what you didn't get to see at the end of that interview is I asked him, you know, now that they have these guilty uh, convictions, what's next? And he told me that it's finally the family's time to take a break, to rest. They've been fighting for over a year and a half now, and they feel that Arbery finally has justice and can finally rest in peace. Brian. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, you can also take a break now, Janelle. I know you've been out there covering this for the last several weeks, so thank you uh, for all, all of your uh, your hard work. I want to bring in uh, our Thanks legal panel me. now. To trial lawyer and social commentator, and Mark O'Mara is a criminal and civil rights attorney. Mark, I want to start with you. Um, less than two days of deliberation, are you surprised how quickly the jury reached its verdict? Brian, I actually am. I was very concerned about both the geography of where it was, the makeup of the panel, the racial overtones that were inherent in this case. And I actually thought it was going to take, one, longer, that they might get past Thanksgiving. And two, I was truly concerned that they might not be able to come to a unanimous decision because of all of the different elements that I just mentioned. But I am very glad that they not only did a good job with the verdict, but it seemed to be a very deliberative verdict. The way they made the decisions between what the individual co-defendants were responsible for, evidence to me at least, that they were really thinking it through, holding Travis responsible for the malice murder as they should, the dad for the felony murder, because obviously he was involved in the chase and whatnot, and even um, Roddy Bryan um, because of that aggravated assault. And I thought they thought it through very well. And hopefully the verdict is accepted by all. And Trent, there was something interesting that I saw on social media uh, right after this verdict came down. A lot of comments of people defending William Bryan. You know, that's the neighbor uh, who shot the video. People surprised that he was also convicted on so many of the counts uh, and that he now also faces life in prison. Did that surprise you, Trent? It didn't. Um, Brian, I wasn't surprised at all. And I, I thought William Roddy Bryan, first of all, should have been found guilty based on the evidence and based on the weight and strength of that evidence. You know, he wasn't found guilty of malice murder. He was simply found guilty of felony murder, as well as uh, false imprisonment and, um, and uh, uh, assault. So, you know, look, I, I'm not surprised that he, was, that he was found guilty on some of those charges. I think the, the reality is he should have been found guilty on those charges. The more serious charges, he was a part and parcel of this. And I, I hearken back to the prosecutor's um, statements when she said to the jury, look, you know, if you're part of the Super Bowl, you get a Super Bowl ring. If you're part of that team, everyone gets a ring. And the reason for that is because he participated in the conduct and the activity that led to Mr. Arbery's death. And by the way, I'd also say that Mr. Uh, Roddy Bryan might choose to separate himself in the federal trial in the way that I think he should have tried to separate himself in this trial, because I think it strategically, Bryan, was not the right choice for him to sort of ride or die with the McMichaels. I think from a factual standpoint and from a strategic standpoint, he had enough there that he probably could have persuaded a judge to separate his case from theirs, and he might have had a better shot at getting some of those charges that he was charged with dismissed. He might have had a better shot of not being lumped in with the McMichaels. And you mentioned that federal trial. I want to get to that in one second. But first, there were a few moments uh, that I think made people a little bit uncomfortable during the trial, where the defense at times uh, almost seemed to put uh, Ahmad Arbery himself on trial. Some of the things that the defense attorney said, uh, people did not seem to react too well. I want to get both of your takes on that in a moment. First, let's listen to one of the defense attorneys uh, during one of those moments. 
turning Ahmad Arbery into a victim after the choices that he made does not reflect the reality of what brought Ahmad Arbery to Satilla Shores in his khaki shorts with no socks to cover his long, dirty toenails. Mark, I want to go to you first. I mean, the long, dirty toenails comment, it really rubbed a lot of people the, lo the wrong way. Uh, do you think that had an impact on the jury? Do you think it sort of backfired on the defense? I think, obviously, in some, it backfired. I, I was concerned and, and, quite honestly, a bit disgusted because that wasn't in context. She wasn't arguing non-jogger and that this is some evidence of that. She really seemed to throw that out in the context of everything else that she was saying about blaming Ahmaud Arbery. It was his decisions. He refused to stop. He refused to listen to them. All he had to do, why was he running? Why was he afraid to get arrested? All of this sort of made up story that there was no evidence to support. And look, I'm a criminal defense attorney. I do this for a living. You, you get to look at the facts and interpret them in a way that helps your client. But the toenails argument or question to me was another dog whistle to several of the jurors potentially saying, look, let's fear the invader. You know, let's fear this guy once again, which uh, I thought was the tact by at least two, if not all three of the defense attorneys uh, to try and play to that, you know, inherent bias and prejudices that we know exist in this country and try and find those in the jury. What do you think, Trent? I mean, we all know what the defense was trying to do there, uh, but, but do you think they went too far? Well, Brian, let's make it abundantly clear. What they were trying to do was to appeal to whatever racial animus existed in some one or many of those jurors in that panel. They didn't know who they were, but as the uh, defense counsel, Mr. Kevin Goss, said um, during the voir dire process, he wanted some bubbas on that jury. And so that was a dog whistle to whoever he presumed, whoever she presumed, to be the bubbas on that jury. And look, I'm not as generous about this as, as Mark was. He was very kind in terms of whether or not there was a specific strategy associated with this. I don't think it was a strategy at all, Brian. This was a dog whistle. This was appealing to a racial animus. This was dehumanizing this man, this victim of a violent crime, so that he would be more easily looked upon as being, well, it's disposable. And the reality is, the dirty nails, the dirty nails was something that those defendants never even saw. It was a comment that came out of the autopsy report when Mr. Arbery's body was being autopsied. It was a comment that was unrelated to any possible connection in fact to anything that these defendants or anyone else would have ever seen. The reality is it was disgusting. It was absolutely beyond the pale that any defendant any defense lawyer should have done on behalf of their, 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 their client. And I think it's something that every lawyer, every sane lawyer in this country feels a little bit of contempt for. Yeah, and it very well may have really uh, turned off the jury. You mentioned earlier the, the federal charges. I want to get into that now. There yeah. uh, is this federal trial that is now looming, uh, a, a federal hate crime charge that the men are facing. Um, let me start with you, Mark. Are these charges hard to prove, and how will this federal trial be different than what we've seen uh, over the last several weeks in state court? Well, the federal trial is going to identify and, and focus specifically on whether or not this was, in fact, a hate crime. And by doing that, they bring in all the information that is not necessarily relevant in the case that we just heard. Because in the federal case, they have to show that the violation of, of his civil rights by killing him and by attempting to kidnap him, but that they did it because of a racial animus, as Trent just said. And it's got to focus on that. So. Their prior history might be relevant. Other acts that they did, some of the comments that they made that didn't get in front of this jury are going to be relevant to try and show that hatred that they have to prove for the hate element of the crime. Mm -hmm. It is going to be a much more emotional trial because of that. The racial animus and the racial disparities are going to come up a lot more. Um, I'm curious whether or not they're going to kick the case down the road a little bit now that they have some um, you know, convictions, some murder convictions, but I do know the federal prosecutor is going to go forward and, con and try and convict. 
And speaking of race, Trent, I want to ask you about this, because when they chose the jury in this trial, a lot of people were surprised and upset that it was mostly a white uh, jury. You had the nine white females, two white males, uh, and just one black male, just one black male on this jury. Um, do you think this sort of proves that that wasn't an issue um, and that maybe that was overblown now that we have these guilty verdicts? No, I don't. Um, in a word, Brian, I, I, I don't. Um, I think really the way this panel was selected, um, I think had a lot to do with racial bias and racial animus. Um, but fortunately, uh, the judge, um, you know, he sort of tried to keep the lawyers focused on the law and under the law, uh, the peremptories, the strikes, these automatic strikes that you get simply for no cause, um, you're allowed to use. And everyone in that courtroom knew, and even the judge presumed that there was probably some racial bias associated with this. But under the law in Georgia, under the law that existed, they were able to strike members of the panel, every lawyer, but it only happened to be the defense lawyers who did it, every member of the panel who happened to be African American, if they could give just a tenable non-racial basis for the selection. So, look, I, I don't think it proves that, but I think it does prove this, that in the face of overwhelming evidence, in the face of 74 days of, of, of waiting, two weeks of protesting, that with overwhelming evidence, an African-American man who has not committed a crime, who is chased by armed white men, can get some measure of justice. And I hate to call this justice for Ahmaud Arbery, because justice for him would be Ahmaud Arbery still alive. Justice for Ahmaud Arbery would be that he still gets to have Thanksgiving with his family. So this isn't justice, but this is a measure of some justice for his family and justice for our country. And I'm really, I feel my, my heart swells because I feel confident that we, despite the fact this has taken place, despite the fact that this was such a horrific case and, it, and it's sort of bookended with the Rittenhouse case, despite that fact, this small town in Georgia, this rural community that these people saw in their heart, that this was proven by beyond a reasonable doubt and I, my heart swells for that. And look, and by the way, Brian, very quickly, Trials are not great social mechanisms for change, but they do reflect in some regard who we are as a country. And I think today, of all days, as we move into Thanksgiving, that we should give thanks that a jury mostly white, almost exclusively white, with only one African-American, found three white men from their community guilty of all these charges. So we are now finished with this uh, with this day trial. We'll have to have you both on again uh, in January when the federal trial starts. Thank you so much, Trent Copeland and Mark O'Mara. I wish you both a very happy Thanksgiving. Trent, Brian, have a great Thanksgiving. Be well. You too. Thank you both. Turning now to the Gabby Petito investigation, we now have a cause of death for the only suspect in her killing, Brian Laundry, and this is really where it gets interesting. A suggestion of possible criminal charges for other parties connected to the case. According to a statement from the Laundrie family attorney, Steve Bertolino, Chris and Roberta Laundrie have been informed that the cause of death was a gunshot wound to the head and the manner of death was suicide. Chris and Roberta are still mourning the loss of their son and are hopeful that these findings bring closure to both families. The other families they are referring to in that statement is, of course, the family of Gabby Petito. After the announcement, Gabby's family released their own statement, which reads, the Schmidt and Petito family has been aware of the circumstances surrounding the suicide of the sole suspect in Gabby's murder. Gabby's family will not be making a statement at this time due to the request of the United States Attorney's Office and the Teton County Prosecutor's Office. The family was asked to not make any comments and let the FBI continue their investigation. The family was also asked, this is important, to wait for the United States Attorney's Office to make a determination on whether any additional individuals will be charged. When that determination is made, we will have a statement to make. It is that last part about additional individuals who could be charged. That could really be something. And we'll discuss it with our legal experts coming up right after this break. Welcome back to Banfield. I'm Brian Enton in for Ashley tonight. We now know the cause of death for Brian Laundrie. It was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. 
He was the only suspect in the killing of Gabby Petito. In any other investigation, his suicide would probably be the end of it, but not this one. We now have hints that other people could possibly be charged in this case. I want to bring in Lawrence Koblinski, who is a renowned forensic scientist and expert in DNA analysis and chairman of the science department at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and Jennifer Koffendoffer, who is a retired FBI uh, special agent. Larry, I want to start with you on this one. With the announcement that Brian's death was a suicide, uh, what kind of physical evidence would they need to make that determination? We know they only found literally Brian Laundrie's bones uh, and a partial skull. How do you think they came to this conclusion? Well, I think examination of the skull, uh, the cranium in particular, would have revealed a fracture of the bone. Uh, and uh, people that uh, know a lot about gunshot uh, understand that the type of fracture that you see in that, in the cranium, would clearly come from gunshot. Um, we know that uh, Brian owned a pistol. Uh, the father, Chris, owned about 10 different handguns, uh, and one of them was actually missing when the police came uh, around September 13th or so, September 17th, I believe, to collect uh, it, uh, evidence from the home. They did collect all of the guns. One was missing. Uh, now, we don't know the make, the model, or the caliber, but I have a feeling the law enforcement knows very well. And it's not clear whether they found the gun at the scene uh, where the, uh, the, the bones were found. Um, you know, metal detectors can, can find shell casings, bullets, uh, and handguns. Uh, so it's just not clear whether the FBI has possession of the murder weapon or not. Uh, but you would need s material like that to close the loop uh, to demonstrate that it was a suicide by gunshot, self-inflicted gunshot. Um, I mean, guns don't just walk away. Uh, it had to be there, unless, of course, somebody else murdered him, which is very, very unlikely given all of the circumstantial evidence that we already have. Yeah, and you bring up a good point, Larry, that I've been thinking about for the last 24 hours. Where is this gun? I mean, we know that this gun was missing, uh, according to, to the laundry parents. Jennifer, uh, what do you think? I mean, where do you think the gun is now? Did, did the FBI have the gun? Is it still in the swamp? What's your gut telling you? I believe it's in an evidence control room under the custody of the FBI, or possibly in an FBI laboratory getting tested to make sure it was an operable gun, that the firing pin was working, and that it had never been used in any other crimes. So I very much believe that it was recovered on that secondary search when they went back out and they were out there for several, several days. I think that's when it was recovered. The only other possibilities are it's still there or a third party has it. And I think it's very probable the FBI has it. Let me ask you this, Jennifer. Larry brought up the laundry parents, uh, Chris and Roberta. And I, I thought this was so interesting yesterday when the Petito uh, parents put out this, this statement saying basically that they've been told to be quiet because there is this possibility that other people could be involved and facing charges. Uh, obviously, our minds immediately go to Chris and Roberta Laundry. Uh, Jennifer, do you think uh, that that is a real possibility at this point, that, that they could end up in trouble with the law? I do think it's a possibility. I found it very interesting, the words that were said. They said the U.S. Attorney's Office, and then they also said the prosecutors in Teton County. Now, they didn't say the FBI. Remember, the FBI is the finder of the fact. The prosecutors, the people that actually bring forth these charges in the judicial system are the prosecutors, and that's who they named. I think the laundries have possible culpability under 18 U.S.C. 3, which is accessory after the fact, and possibly 18 U.S.C. 1519, which is obstruction in terms of if they tampered with any evidence after that crime was committed. 
Larry, what do you think? I mean, we know from the Laundry's family attorney, Steve Bertolino, that they had this collection of guns that you mentioned, that they, according to him, turned them all over when Brian Laundry initially went missing. But there was this one missing gun that we still don't know where it is. Uh, do you think the parents could be in legal trouble? I think they might be in trouble with respect to aiding and abetting uh, Brian Laundry evading detection, uh, running away from the, uh, the police. Um, somebody may have been helping him, most likely the parents, uh, it could have been somebody else that we don't even know about. But uh, again, you know, the likelihood is that he didn't do this alone. He may have had assistance uh, and whoever did help him um, can can be penalized, can uh, can suffer legal consequences for aiding and abetting his escape. And Jennifer, another thing I've been thinking a lot about, and I think you have too, is now that we know there was this missing gun that apparently the FBI knew about, they knew when the Laundries turned over their guns that there was one missing. And this is when Brian Laundrie was still missing. We didn't know if he was dead or alive at that point. Did the FBI, Jennifer, have some kind of obligation to, to almost alert the public, because at that point, it was, it, it was almost like there was a killer on the run that, who was armed. Do you think they should have said something? No, Brian, I, I don't think they should have said something. There are a lot of facts in this case that they have, and they've kept close to the vest as well they should. It's almost impossible to run a successful interrogate, or sorry, investigation when you have everything out in front of the public for their knowledge. Now, I understand the concern of the public, but they were doing everything in their power to find him in that reserve and everything in their power to find him at some points throughout other parts of the United States and the Appalachian Mountains and following all these leads. So they certainly did everything uh, that they possibly could to keep him uh, at the forefront of their investigation in terms of the fugitive hunt for him. It's certainly going to be interesting to see how this plays out. There's still so many questions that are left unanswered that hopefully uh, we'll, get, we'll get some sort of answer to soon. Jennifer Koffendoffer and Larry Kobolinski, uh, thank you so much for your time and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, Brian. Thank you. you. Guys, have a good night. Okay, turning now to the search for Summer Wells. Another really mysterious case. The five-year-old girl, she has been missing since June 15th. Her parents, Don and Candace Wells, say Summer was abducted from their home, but law enforcement says there is no evidence that anyone took her. We've been in a holding pattern now for more than five months with this young girl's life at stake, but now there is a new reward offered in the case. This is brand new. Will that create some movement in the investigation? We're gonna look into it coming up. Welcome back to Banfield. I'm Brian Enton in for Ashley tonight. Five-year-old Summer Wells has been missing for more than five months now with absolutely no leads. Today it was announced the reward for information related to her disappearance has surpassed $70,000. I'm joined by Stacey Honowitz. She is a 30-year veteran of the Florida State Attorney's Office and supervisor of the Sex Crimes and Child Abuse Unit. Uh, Stacey, uh, you're also a longtime friend of mine, so I was excited that you were on the, on the show tonight. The first thing uh, I wanted to ask you, Stacey, is this reward, now up to $70,000. We've seen high rewards in other cases. Uh, there was the Michael Joseph Vaughn case, a, a missing five-year-old. It was a $26,000 reward. There was, of course, the Brian Laundry uh, missing uh, situation that happened for a while, that reward went up to $170,000. Do you think that the money actually motivates people uh, in these searches? I absolutely do. I mean, if you don't have any leads, and we know that this has been ongoing for, for five months or so, you have to do something to try to motivate, to try to generate something. As you know, we have Crime Stoppers. There's always things on television where we see, make an anonymous call if you know anything. And certainly a money reward is going to do something to maybe jumpstart something in that community because right now they have nothing. 
So, Stacey, I was in um, Tennessee last week uh, looking into this case, and it is a strange one. And, and Summer's parents have really been under uh, the microscope. Uh, their names are Don and Candace Wells. And something really strange that I haven't seen before is Don, the dad, what he does is sometimes late in the night, 12 or 1 in the morning, uh, he'll call into these YouTube shows uh, and he will just sort of open up and start talking about the case. I want to play you a clip from one of the times he called into the shows. This one, yeah, the name of the show is Mr. and Mrs. Share. Uh, listen to what Don said on this show. And you can see, Stacy in the background there, it was daylight. But there are times the dad will call into these shows in the middle of the night, like from his bed and in the house. And I mean, what do you make of that? Do you think it's strange that, that he's sort of frequently calling into the YouTube shows? I don't think that anybody can put themselves in that position and say what the parent is doing is strange. If they're looking for their daughter, if he's got no part in any of this, which right now there doesn't seem to be uh, that, he, that he's a lead in, in this investigation as, as a participant. But I think anybody that's experiencing this, if this is a way for him, it's like a catharsis to talk about it, to be able to get things out there. He, is, he said he's under some kind of gag order, but he wants to be able to kind of fight back against the negative things that people are saying about him. He does have a history, he does have a past. So naturally, in these kinds of situations, the police, the FBI, they automatically want to know if there's some kind of connection. So they will bring up his past. People want to know if he's had trouble with the law. And so I think this is his way of trying to tell everybody, here's what's going on. I don't know what you're hearing. I maybe have a past, but I'm trying to find her just like everybody else is. So do I find it strange? Some people might think that it is. I think for somebody that's going through something like this, if this is a way for him to get some sense of relief Far be it for me to say that it's not natural for him to do it. Yeah, and you're right, Stacey. I mean, none of us can put ourselves in the mind of someone going through that. People, you know, have different ways that, that, that they process and grieve, and he's obviously trying uh, to, to look for his daughter, and perhaps that's a way that, that he thinks he can be effective. So uh, we'll just have to see where this goes. I hope they find Summer soon. Uh, thank you so much, Stacey, Stacey, for being on the show tonight, and uh, happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.